Thank you all for being here. My name is Daniela. I'm a student at the University of Washington studying public health, and I've been an intern at Roots for the past six months. I want to thank our guest speakers for coming and sharing their stories, and also all you guys for arriving. Um, Roots is a low barrier emergency shelter for guests ages 18 to 25, located just one block away at the University Temple Church, with the vision that everyone has a safe place to call home. If there's one thing I learned, it's that anyone can end up experiencing homelessness with a stroke of mis misfortune, and we need to do a better job of listening and treating others with respect. Tonight, we must model the value of inclusion in our conversation and challenge efforts to silence the voices of people who have been marginalized or excluded. Being inclusive is an acknowledgement of the injustices that have, been, that have brought us to this point. It is an investment in the durability and the solidarity of our communities and the efficacy of our work. And it's to the rejection of the idea that any of us deserves to remain vulnerable or to be left out of this conversation. With that, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Tyrone, a former guest of Roots, to speak about his experience. Just going to put me on blast like that, huh? That's, that's really messed up. So, um, hi, as again, my name is Tyrone Evans Floyd. Um, yes, I was one of the, um, I wouldn't say recent, but in the past, I stayed at Roots for almost a year. Um, unfortunately, the reason why I was at Roots in the first place because I spent 18 years in foster care. Um, I got out of foster care, they just kicked me right out. Um, I didn't have time to really, to really grow, to mature. So because of that, I made a lot of mistakes growing up. Um, definitely in my younger adult years, um, made a, t a lot of terrible decisions. Um, but if it really wasn't for roots, um, places around here, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at today. Um, I really didn't get a lot of help through the system in foster care. I tried a lot of things, football, basketball, JRTC, you know, a lot of things, and I kept getting turned down. I didn't want to try to fall into the stereotype, you know, African-American, black guy, angry, tall, black, ah, you know, type thing. Um, I really just wanted to better myself at the end of the day because I knew eventually once I'm out here on my own, that's it. There's no handouts and I don't believe in handouts. You know, everything I work for has been absolutely on my own besides, uh, you know, the help from, you know, Roots and the wonderful organizations that's been around Washington. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't have none of that back at home in, in Georgia. I stayed in Atlanta a year and a half. I was homeless out there, had no place to stay, sleeping outside, but I was working. But it was just so expensive. Um, unfortunately, people found out that uh, I was homeless and pretty much I got pressured to leave. <clears throat> because of that, that brought me up here. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a tough road for me, but you know, still today I'm 30 years old. I don't do any drugs or alcohol, never did. You know, I'm not an alcoholic. I never, hell, I never smoked weed, not a day in my life, you know. But at the end of the day, it just proved that I can accomplish anything if I put my mind to it, you know. And it's wonderful people like Roots and other organizations that's around here that got me to where I'm at, where, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> that got me to where I'm at today. You know, and I don't want to try to give y'all more of a boo-hoo story. I don't want y'all crying here or anything like that. But, um, yeah, that's pretty, pretty much it, technically. Thank you. Casper, would you like to speak? Yeah. My name is Casper. Um, I'm a former client at Roots, I guess. My name is Casper. Um, I'm a former guest at Roots right now. Um, I was in the foster care system as well. My parents divorced when I was 15 years old, and that's when I was in the foster care system. I was supposed to go home in two weeks, you know, and they divorced. And so that kind of set me off into a different direction. Started running away from the group homes that I was staying at. And when I was running away from them, 
I was obviously meeting some people that I shouldn't have met. Um, my family, I felt like my childhood and my family was torn away from me. Uh, I moved to Oceanside when I had run away and uh, I got gang affiliated. Um, I did a lot of drugs, drank my life, drank my life away. And, you know, I kept going back and forth into the foster care system, running away. You know, it was just a back and forth thing. When I turned 18, um, they kind of sent me on my way. And I had no idea what to do. I didn't know what being an adult was. I didn't even have a childhood. So having all of that put upon you, like, hey, you're supposed to find a place to live. You're supposed to get a job. You're supposed to go and pay rent, pay your bills. It was extremely just blew me away. I had no idea what to do. So when I turned 18, um, I was very upset in my life. Uh, my mom I still haven't talked to. Uh, my dad was somewhere far away. And so I overdosed really, really bad on drugs. Today, I am two years and seven months clean and sober. Um, I refuse to let my family's decisions and the foster care's decisions bring me down to a lower level and make me feel as if, you know, I have to sit down on the street, hold a sign, and ask people for money. I want to do something with my life, and Roots has, you know, really helped that over the time. And uh, I always come back. I love the staff there. They're amazing, great people. And so, yeah, that's about it. Thank you. Thank you, Casper and Tyrone. Okay, so we're going to start with our panel, starting with some panelist introductions. So we're going to start with you, Nancy. We can go down the line if you want to grab onto that microphone and just talk about your, introduce yourself and your background. So is this where I tell how I got involved with homelessness? Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, so I'm Nancy Amade. I used to teach here at the School of Social Work. And I got involved because I was brand new at the school, just setting up my office. I got a call from the dean saying, oh, I'm so glad you're there. There's somebody here I want you to listen to. Please hear her out, and whatever you can do to help, please help. And moments later, a stocky little lady came into the office saying, all right, I just told this story to your dean, and now I have to tell it again to you. But OK. I work for the church council right up the street. And I want you to know, I work on homelessness, and the University of Washington is the biggest neighbor in the neighborhood. But when it comes to homelessness, you people aren't even at the table, and you ought to be ashamed. <laughs> Welcome to the University of Washington in the U District. <laughs> um, but as a result of that, we ended up putting together a meeting with her and five other people from community groups in the U District. And I got five other faculty from around the university. We had a meeting at Architecture and Urban Planning, six on one side, six on the other. And what grew out of that was something called the UUPFY, the U District University Partnership for Youth. And we began mon meeting monthly. And before long, we had 150 organizations and or individuals who were part of the PFY. And that was in... Oh, I guess it must have been in late 92 that we started. And by 1995, we were having a community-wide conference. And part of what we wanted to do was hear more from the youth themselves about what they needed. And one outgrowth of that, there were a couple of projects that came out of that conference. One of them was the youth said, when you're homeless, it's really hard to finish high school or to get a diploma. So we raised some money and hired a teacher who was at the U District Youth Center. They agreed to house the teacher, and now I think there are three full-time teachers, and it's part of the school system, and you can get um, a high school diploma there. But at one point, you couldn't get anything, even a GED. And that was one of the projects. Another project that came out of it was um, the uh, MedRest for youth who were too ill to be in a shelter, but not sick enough to be in a hospital. So this was a place where you could stay when you were sick, and we had people, nurse practitioners, and nursing faculty and stuff. And I can't read that from a distance. Do you want me to stop? For another minute or two? Okay. 
Um, and a third project which I think should be revived was something we call TLP, the launching pad. Because youth also told us that even if they could get a job and we helped you know, start some job programs, that you couldn't afford any place to live when you had to pay that upfront money for first and last month's rent and utility deposits. So TLP was a program we put together. We raised some money so that you could get a one-year loan of enough money for that upfront money plus a mentor in your life for a year because for the most part they were young people who didn't have a grown-up in their lives who could be nice to them and help every now and then in a friendly way. Um, so and that one no longer survives, but I hope somebody will think about putting that kind of thing together again. I think it's probably very useful. And um, so that was, the conference was in, I think, 95 or 96. And then in 2008, a group of church people started getting together to say, you know, we aren't doing enough in this dis district, and there are a lot of homeless people, and especially young people, and we've got to do something, something more than what we're doing. And the result of that was the U District Conversation on Homelessness. And now that has been running since 2008, 2009. And we have monthly meetings, and some of them are here at the UW. And all of you are welcome to come to a monthly UDCH meeting. Um, and among other things, we were the people who started putting together a brochure of resources for homeless people in the U District. And then we started talking more recently, the U District Street Medicine Group went out and said, these need to be updated. And when they started talking to people, what they heard was, yeah, you can't have it just one for everybody. We need two. We need one for the adults, and we need another one for youth, because the services are different. So that's why we now have two that are available all over the place, plus more recently, you probably have noticed that Real Change has put out these full of information about where you can get services. And the local library has a ton of stuff, all of it color-coded for all kinds of different services. So there's a lot of stuff that's going on now that's much better than back when we started. But goodness knows there's still a lot to be done. I think the two lessons I want to mention up front are, if that woman from the church council, Josephine Archuleta, had not stormed into my office that day. You never know when you ask somebody something and you can actually make a difference. But part of what made a difference was people getting together. It isn't going to be one person who's going to change everything. We've got to work together and we've got to speak up and talk about this with everybody. And I think the other important lesson over the years has been listen to the people that you want to help. Don't think that the big shots at the university with the fancy studies are the ones who have the answers. Ask the people who need the help. That's it. Thank you, Nancy. Casper and Tyrone, you guys, do you guys want to say your name again? Just pass on the mic, Nancy, please. <laughs> <laughs> Just introduce yourself again. Uh, my name is Lois Thetford, and uh, my work has primarily been through healthcare. So, um, back in the um, 60s, there were no community health clinics, there were no places for people to go, just the emergency room. Um, and so, I was involved with the group of people that. Um, set up the community health system that we have in Seattle. Um, I'm a founder of the 45th Street Clinic in Wallingford and I've worked there for 40 years. Um, but our very first clinic that we did was right here in the U District. It was called the Open Door Clinic and it worked with youth living in the youth and on the streets. So it was, and I knew homeless people when I was growing up in New Jersey as well. Um, but, um, so part of the purpose of community health clinics was to offer a range of services to people. And um, so anyone could come in and receive care without 
there being a barrier there. Um, but in the early 80s, um, the, the number of homeless people skyrocketed because of the mainstreaming uh, put into place by the Reagan administration um, of turning people out of institutions but not uh, funding community psychiatric and other kinds of services that they needed and so thousands of people all of a sudden were living on the streets. Um, and so uh, there was the government really, of course, they caused the problem, so they weren't actually excited about fixing anything that they had done. Um, and they were also cutting back on HUD, on the housing. Um, and the person at, who was the secretary at the time, Jack Kemp, was very proud of the fact that he had trimmed the budget for housing. And um, and so we've been short of low-income housing since around 1982. We just get more and more and more behind. Um, here in Seattle, the Seattle Housing Authority has redeveloped all of the areas, and only 50% of them are below market rate or low-income housing. So there's a 50% loss of low-income housing by the agency whose job it is, is to create low-income housing. <laughs> and they have gone through, you know, Rainier Vista and Rainier Park and Highline. And, you know, they finally got to Yesler. That's their, their final one. And, um, you know, they just turned out everyone who lived there and they're making these high rises. So one of the big issues is that health care and homelessness are very closely connected. And that is that many people become homeless because of a major health crisis. Um, health, health care costs are the primary cause of bankruptcy in the United States. It causes like 60 some percent. Um, so you go through bankruptcy, you lose your house, you're homeless. And um, and then there's, you know, not being able to work. And then there's the fact that if you get on disability, you can't afford to live on disability. It pays like $700 a month. And you can't rent a closet in Seattle for $700 a month, let alone live and eat. So, um, so my work has primarily been with homeless uh, outreach. Um, so since um, 1985, I have worked in um, daycare centers, battered women's shelters, family programs, schools, daycare centers, youth centers, and, um, and now I'm primarily focused on um, tent cities and small, tiny, small house, tiny house villages. There we go. Um, and I'm working right now on a project to create um, a peer support person within each tiny village and each tent city where they can work with the people in their camp and um, supply them with blood pressure cuffs and and uh, blood sugar testing and referral information and sort of beef up what actually already happens is that people are always helping each other but with more support with more resources and education more people could get healthy. Um, oh, can I ask the, the timekeeper maybe take this chair because my I, my glasses I need new new ones so I can't read what's on the paper. But could you maybe that chair right there? Okay. Um, so my name is Sochi Makovich, and I'm the political director for Washington Community Action Network. We are a grassroots organization with over 40,000 members in the state. We work on a variety of issues. So we're originally a healthcare organization, but as time has gone on, uh, in, partic in particular over the past couple years, we've started working around housing issues, uh, mass incarceration issues, and immigration issues in addition to healthcare. So on housing in particular, we've been doing a lot of work around tenant rights uh, because 
you know, landlords discriminate against people from even getting into housing. Uh, it's really hard to get into housing and keep housing because of how high rent is. And then it's really easy to kick you out of housing. It takes about three weeks to evict someone. So um, we are working to organize renters and uh, push for policy changes on the local and state level to uh, level the pl playing field. So that's it. Again, thank you all for being here. So starting with our first question, why are people homeless? And we can go down the line or whoever wants to jump in. Well, I think there are a couple of obvious things. Do we need the I think there are a couple of obvious things. One is the lack of housing that people can afford if they aren't rich. And the second is the lack of services to help people whose lives are in turmoil or chaos or any kind of major problem. I think that's a big part. Um, one of the things about homelessness is that there are really different stories. Everybody's story has um, individual aspects to it, but poverty is the overwhelming one. Um, I mean, the only exception to that is that um, 60 to 75 percent of family homelessness um, is caused by domestic violence. And domestic violence does not respect what class you're in. So you can be rich and have to leave home because of domestic violence. But for the most part, um, the inequality of our system, structural racism, the whole class system that everyone denies that we have, um, causes poverty to be an intergenerational thing and um, there is such little understanding of how this economic system makes it so difficult for people to get ahead. Not impossible, but really, really hard. Um, well, I think I'll, I'll say two things. So one, I think we as a society don't really value the concept that we need to help each other. Uh, there, that's why it once you become homeless, it's so hard to get into housing. There's like so few resources to actually help uh, people who are on the verge of losing housing. And it, there's this just narrative that you just need to buck up, get you know, pull those bootstraps up, and and get it together. But the thing is, is that our system is set up so that unless you are in the top 1%, you're not really going to be able to make it. Um, and so, you know, because I feel like a lot of times luck has helped me because I've been late on my rent before, and it's luck that has prevented me from getting evicted, not like anything else other than that. And uh, so I think that we need a huge soci societal shift because I think a lot of times people who are doing okay think that they have more in common with the 1% than they do with people who are struggling. But it's so easy to become someone, if you're not struggling right now, it's so easy to become that person. Um, I've been going through all the eviction uh, evictions that happened last year looking at court records. And you'll see letters in the court records that tenants have written their landlord. I've seen everything ranging from a woman in a child custody battle, and that's contributed to why she can't pay for rent, to people, to I think this one guy who was undocumented, didn't qualify for unemployment, got laid off. His dad had a brain aneurysm all in the same month. And guess what happened? They still got evicted because our system set up so that it doesn't matter if you're a dollar late, doesn't matter why you're late, if the landlord can just throw you out. It takes the quickest the landlord can get you out legally is 17 days, right from the day you're late to the day the sheriff is throwing your stuff outside. So I think that we just need a huge societal shift in how we think about housing, how we think about how we need to take care of each other. And I also think just on the policy side of things, we need to level out the playing field quite a bit. Thank you. Okay, the next question. Oh, I don't know. Okay. 
Um, why does Seattle have such a large homeless population? I think it's the, the things that I mentioned and you're hearing from other people as well. If we had affordable housing, we wouldn't have such a terrible homeless problem. Um, I, I think that's just a huge piece of it. And I also think that our upside down tax system is part of it. If we had a fairer tax system, we could have the revenues to produce the affordable housing and we wouldn't have a major upheaval over whether or not we're going to pay for housing for people. Um, totally agree with that. So the follow-up is, how has this affected the services available to folks? So there just aren't enough services. Um, people are going hungry. Um, people are having to eat food that's not healthy for them. Um, people are being forced to into situations that they never would have imagined. Like when Tent City was here on campus last year, um, there's a 25-year-old man and his partner. Both of them have full-time jobs. They had housing. They had a, a problem with their landlord, and so they had arranged to move to a different place. And... Um, the day came to move and the person said, oh, I already gave it to somebody else, too bad. And um, they lived at Tent City for three weeks because there was no place that they could go when they just happened to be screwed over by, by their future landlord and their past landlord. And just, you know, average people. I, I precept students down at the... Downtown Emergency Service Center, which is our largest and most chaotic and scary place to be. And um, there are regularly people who come in and like this one woman was brought by another resident because she was like hysterical and she said, I'm going to die here. I, I'm, a, I'm just a woman who has worked all my life. I'm a single mom. My daughter's doing her master's in London. I just had a problem with our, something happened to our building where they, we had to move out. It was like a, a water damage that got into the walls. So it had nothing to do with any mistakes that she had made, but she ended up not being able to get into housing. And here she is, this average person, about 48 or 50, has no understanding of how to live on the street. And she said, they keep telling me, you just have to look scary and that way you'll be all right. And she was like about 5'2", skinny little person, and she had no way to look scary. There's nothing in her that gave her that. She's like, I can't look scary. I'm... I, I just want to leave here, but if I go out onto the streets, I know uh, it'll be worse. And I'm like, right. So we made a plan. We sat down. I sent her to somebody. And, um, you know, there's just, there are so many different kinds of homeless situations that are happening now, and there really are not anywhere near enough services, whether we're talking about simple social work, case management, um, at, at the shelters, their staff has terrible turnover, and it's really tough. Um, and just, you know, every kind of service we need, there just isn't enough. So, uh, one, I think one other thing is how um, expensive Seattle has gotten. So, a lot of properties that are subsidized have a low-income tax credit, which is a federal program that's administered by the state. But the the rent is based on the area median income, right? So you might be in a unit that is set for, this will be affordable for people that are 30% of the area median income. Guess what's happened in Seattle over the past couple years? That area median income is like, I mean, I, last I saw is the, uh, the area median income for a household in this region is $103,000. Right. So if you're basing 
subsidize rent, people who are on social security, people who are, you know, waiters, people who are just, you know, normal people that are not tech bros, uh, you're, you're still going to be paying really, really high rent. And we've had members who, because the rent is based on the area median income, because rent has gone, uh, because the median income has gone up so much, even though they're in these subsidized buildings, their rents have doubled, right? And there is no control on how high a landlord can increase rent because that's really sides quick side story on that in 1981 a bunch of developers and landlords went to the state legislature and put a ban on any form of rent regulation and so no city could say hey you can't double rent in a year so I've seen people's rents go up thousands of dollars with the 30-day notice and what happens when you can't pay your rent well, the landlord will serve you, serve you a three-day notice. If you don't pay within those three days, the landlord doesn't have to take your money and can just go ahead with an eviction proceeding. Right? So even if you come up with all the money on the fourth day. And on top of that, just I, I know I'm getting a little Louise, I'll be super quick, but uh, landlords can give you late, late fees. They can give you legal notice or legal fees. They can give you a fee just for you, for them giving you a three-day notice. Right, so just getting a three-day notice, you're looking at several hundreds of dollars on top of your rent that you're back. And let's say you catch up on the rent, they can still evict you for not paying those late fees. Right, so it's just a system that I think is the epitome of greed, and that's pushing people into homelessness. So, uh, I, I don't, I don't no, need that. Yeah, oh, okay, so, so uh, I totally have to agree with everything y'all say from experience. So like I said, I'm from Georgia. We're really not that expensive in the South, you know? We're pretty cheap as hell, technically. And um, the funny thing about it, when I came up here, when I moved up here, I only moved up here with $300 in my pocket, literally $300 in my pocket. And I moved up here also to better myself. But the one thing that threw me off is how expensive this place is. And um, our minimum wage back then in Georgia was seven twenty-five an hour. And I remember coming up here and getting my first job, literally the first week here, working at a bowling alley. And I was making $11 an hour. I thought I was the man. And I was like, man, I, I'm the man. I'm about to make all this money. And I looked at my check. And I was just like dumbfounded because I pretty much had no money at all. So I was like, well, this might take a little bit longer than expected to try to find a house because I'm like, well, house can't be that expensive up here. And I was looking at rooms and houses and stuff like that. And it was this 600 square foot um, studio apartment, $1,300 a month. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, so for technically the reason why I was pretty much homeless the whole entire year because everything was so expensive and not only that they wanted me to pay for last month rent I wasn't there last month why should I pay for last month rent for it I was probably somebody else was staying there like I shouldn't have to pay for last month rent you out your damn mind but tech, but still you know at the end of the day it was hard for me because I, did, I just didn't realize how expensive Seattle was you know and and you said something about late fees. So my my boss is, excuse my language, my boss is a douche, okay? We all have one of those bosses that are completely buttholes. So, so, um, so he pays us on the 7th of each month, right? Now understand, besides me being in a relationship, you know, with this beautiful woman here, I'm technically a single dad. My son's five years old. Okay, and we have to. I have to drive to Bellevue to pick up my check every month on the seventh of each month. My late fees are almost three hundred dollars at the end of the day. You know, so my rent is twelve hundred. Well, well, eleven hundred a month. So I'm literally almost paying a good, almost fifteen, almost fifteen technically all together. You know, so. I, I, I completely understand. That's besides Seattle being a beautiful place, but damn, y'all so expensive here. It's, it's no joke, no joke at all. It's not even funny. So the next question, we have Jessica Hill. Hello. 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 Hello.
What are the groups that are disproportionately impacted by homelessness and why? <laughs> so, um, here in King County, um, people of African American descent are a fairly small fraction of the total population. Um, and they are 39, per, I can't remember if it's 7 or 9 percent or something like that of the King County population, but they're f something like 39 percent of homeless individuals. And that is one of the clear results of the way that our system is structured. But youth, women and children, old people, disabled people, that's actually a lot of the population. They are all very disproportionately represented among the homeless. Nationally, 37% um, of homeless individuals are women and children. Most of those children are um, fairly young, um, and we know that housing, dis housing instability at a really young age and um, a lot of kids who are pre-K through grade five, it really affects their whole school career. It affects their sense of uh, stability. It can cause you to have both physical and mental um, deficits that go on through life. And um, it's really damaging to have children see this much trauma, to be this much disrupted, um, to not, you know, to, to see parents abused in front of them, shot in front of them. There are so many things about it. All those kids really need therapeutic daycare and school experiences that cater to them. Um, the Seattle Public Schools does have programs in a lot of different schools. Originally it was five elementary schools, one middle school and one high school that had special programs for homeless children. And some of the children that I was taking care of were not at one of those schools. And um, they said to me, um, the kids are harassing us. And I went to the playground uh, supervising teacher and I said you know these kids are really trying to bully us and the teacher just looked at me and said I don't see any blood and uh, and they're like so you know we don't feel safe with the school we don't feel safe with the kids or the teachers um, and I knew that school and I went and gave them a piece of my mind um, but you know, that's just because those kids had somebody to tell that story to. Um, and there's so many difficult, what are we on here? Impacted. <laughs> the high impact. So I'll just say that. I don't think I have anything else to add. Um, Y'all just, just going to put me on the spot all the time. Just. So... <clears throat> I guess I, I can only say based off my um, experiences when I kind of I kind of knew that I was going to be homeless ahead of time. Um, I already knew that the system was technically setting me up for failure early when I was getting denied um, to play football, um, to play basketball, to play any type of sports. Um, unfortunately, being black in the South, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, throw race, not race, but race in there. You know, it's, it's very difficult being a young black man in the South. You know, they expect for you to be a certain type of way. And with me, it's like I wanted to better myself. And the last thing I wanted to do was to sleep outside. You know, I wanted to have a better lifestyle than how I was raised because I was just being thrown in group homes and everything countless of times. And um, and it kept just turning me down the whole entire time. So by the time I was homeless, you know, I was just, you know, just stressed out, depressed. You know, I lost all my hair, you know, thank God I have my beard. But still, you know, I just it was it was it was a very stressful. It was I, I could literally say it was like some of the worst moments of my life. Um, 
thank God I had stuff to do, like hobbies and stuff like that to keep my mind occupied. You know, because I wasn't homeless because I did drugs. I wasn't homeless because I was doing stupid stuff. I was homeless because of other people's judgment, you know, and how they treated me and stuff like that. You know, and I was alone at it, you know, still today, you know, kind of today, you know, I don't have certain resources of people to go to when I'm having certain problems and issues, you know, technically I don't have health insurance, so I can't go counseling to speak to my therapist about my severe depression that I still have today, the suicidal thoughts, because the stuff that I had to go through being harassed by police officers because I'm sleeping on some bleacher, you know, some somewhere out in the street and have to go to work four hours later you know so i still have traumatizing stuff that goes through my mind on a daily basis you know because of the stuff that i've been through you know so i just personally believe that people have their own personal demons that they have to deal with i think people should be more open-minded to what people go through because not everybody's going through the same thing you know, everybody have their own personal problem that they have to deal with. And you have to respect those individual, you know, separately, not the same. And I know you guys have touched on this already, but what are the, what is the relationship between health, housing, and homelessness? I, I can't add to what Lois said. So, um, like, it's two things, as you were talking, it was making me think of one thing is, um, so this kind of going back to another question, but one thing that I think a lot of people don't realize is that if you are undocumented, a lot of services are locked out to you. There are certain legal providers that can't even give you legal advice. They, you, there are certain shelters that can't take you just because you don't have a social security number, just because you are not. Uh, legal permanent resident or whatever and so people who because I and I and I'm thinking about this in particular today is because so my phone number is like floating around in the ether so sometimes I get calls from people being like hey what do I do even though we're a political group there that's a sign to me of how terrible our uh, system is that if they're reaching out to a political group for like what do I need to do in this so I'm like learning a lot about the bureaucracy that exists um, but this one woman she's a trans woman who's a domestic violence survivor who is undocumented right and the resources that exist for her are so limited you know, we're gonna try, and, and pretty much what she has to rely on is an informal network of people. And that's not good, that's not how our system should work. And I think, and then kind of going back to this question around the relationship between health and health, housing, as I've been going through the court records, I'm also looking at death records. And it is astounding, because the medical examiner keeps a list of people who died and that the medical examiner is presuming that they died while homeless, right? That the medical examiner could not find where they were living. And one thing that just, I can't get out of my head this, just reading this one thing was I found someone who they were evicted last year and they were evicted for not even a full month's worth of rent. And about a month later, he shot himself in a West Seattle park and he, there was like there was nothing else on court records or anything. This was the only thing I could find, like public records wise. You know, and I, I don't know what was going on else was going on in his life, right? But like for me, just seeing like that timeline, like this person was evicted. They were on the list of presumed homeless, so he did not find housing. And he shot himself. There was another person I found who, in, in Washington, outside, outside of, you have a little bit more protections on this if you're in Seattle, but outside of Seattle, a landlord can just terminate your lease with 20 days notice, right? So they can just be like, I don't like you, bye. So this woman did not leave after that, so she went through an eviction proceeding. And about a year later, she died, and she was on the list of presumed homeless, and she was, I think, 52 or 53, and she died of hypertension, right? Like, how do we exist in a world where you can die of something that's preventable, you know? And again, like, I don't, again, I don't know the circumstances, right, behind anything other than what I'm seeing in these court records. But for me, I think that housing is a life or death issue and I think that our government 
doesn't embrace that, and that's just leading to people dying. Um, just two quick things that have been coming up as people have been talking here. I trust you know that if you're homeless, getting dental care is almost impossible. And there have been times when there have been dental vans that are available, but they're very expensive and they're hard to maintain. And so that's just one small thing, but also there are medical vans. The university used to have a medical van and it used to go to the homeless shelters and it used to go to the youth serving programs. And when the van broke down, the very nice people here who maintain vehicles for the university offered to do that for free, to fix it up for free, and the lawyers said, no way. They said they would do it on their own time, and the lawyers said, oh, but what if something happened? We might get sued. Um, the, the reasons why we don't have health care and dental care are sometimes coming down to some very small things that those of us who are lucky enough to have that care could be speaking up about. Okay, we'll go on to the next question. What are some of the barriers to ending homelessness in Seattle? Well, as, as we've talked about, homelessness has some generalities and a lot of individual cases. Um, but obviously we need affordable housing. There needs to be enough affordable housing for all the people. When we started doing health care for the homeless in 85, um, the average wait for housing was just under two years. Um, and like when we first started going to like food banks and things like that to just talk to people, uh, one man came up to us with a little pad of paper and said, you know, I'm deaf and I need housing. And so uh, it was me and our social worker that were doing outreach. And um, so she took down his name and information and a way to contact him. And um, she checked when we got back to the clinic, because this was 85, it was, you couldn't do it on your phone then. Um, and his name had come to the top of the list, but nobody knew how to reach him. Um, so we went back and we found him again and we said, you know, you are now able to get housing. And he, it was like, great way to start. <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, a success. Um, but he'd waited his two years living on the street as a deaf person, you know, really undernourished, really not in good health, but, you know, he finally got into housing. The wait now is like six years. Um, <laughs> I mean, two years is way too long. Six years is impossible, you know? Like, what are you supposed to do for six years until affordable housing becomes available to you? Um, so I, I think that, you know, that situation is one of the biggest ones. And the other one, as you said, is really greed. You know, people don't have to charge $3,000 for a one-bedroom apartment. It's actually not necessary. I'm sure that their taxes are not that much different, you know? But they do because they can. And it's just unconscionable. Lobbyist. Well, not all. I'm technically a lobbyist, so hopefully I'm not a bear. Some lobbyist. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give like I'll give a specific example. A lot of the landlord lobbying groups, right? So one of the first uh, th ways that my organization got involved in housing was pushing for and and. One thing is the city of Seattle has not spent money educating people about some of the, these new laws, so I'm going to say a lot of people probably don't even know about this. Hopefully you do. But um, we pushed for a law that requires landlords to accept payment plans for your security deposit and last month's rent. We couldn't say you can't ask for last month's rent because that would be rent regulation and that's banned by the state. But we pushed for that law, right? So you can pay for your deposit over time in the city of Seattle. The landlord has to accept that. Now, in the span of about, and when you're lobbying, you're supposed to report how much money you're spending talking to a, a, an elected official, right? So that 
lobbying group, my group, all groups, if they have a staff person talking to an elected official, you have to report how much money it is. They spent almost, collectively the landlord organization spent over $50,000 just talking to council members, trying to fight this bill. Right? We spent like a thousand, I also get paid a lot less than <laughs> those landlord lobbyists. Um, and so, but even then, like that's an example of how much time they spent. Now we were able to still win a very strong law, but they're, they're lobbying in, the, in Olympia. Like when I, we, we pushed for, and we were successful in getting legislation introduced that would repeal the ban on rent regulation. And it was mind blowing. The realtors were out there, developers were out there, landlord lobbying groups, they're all out there fighting this, right? But it's a barrier, but it's not an insurmountable one because the, the way that an organization like mine overcomes that is with people, right? Because at the end of the day, elected officials have to listen to constituents. Money only works because money goes to candidate campaigns who help them reach more people. But if we have more people on our side pushing for, hey, you know, I don't think it's right that you're charging late fees just for paying your rent on the 7th. Like that's absolutely, $300 in late fees is absolutely insane. Unfortunately, I'm not surprised, right? We could push, and I'll say my organization might be pushing for stuff like that, so you should let me know if you're interested. <laughs> um, but uh, we can push for all of these changes. We can push for, hey, you shouldn't evict someone in 17 days. Because guess what, if you're in New York, it would take months, right? If you're, if you're in Ohio, the, the judge could consider, why was this person late? Oh, they were in the hot, I mean, I have a member who contracted MRSA, couldn't pay his rent because, you know, he was dying in a hospital. He got served eviction papers while in the hospital. He had a friend who was a lawyer who, who actually tried to deal with it in absentia. But again, because our law is so black and white, he didn't pay. It doesn't matter that he's dying in the hospital. He survived, but he came out of that homeless for two years, right? That is entirely legal, but it is unethical. But we can change that if we come together, if we organize, and we push our elected officials to say, look, like, let's have some morality in our laws. But until then, greed, high-paid lobbyists will be a barrier. I also want to talk about different kinds of prejudice. Um, transgender and LGBT youth are a very high percentage, um, up to 40%, um, and have a really hard time, not just getting housing, but getting jobs, and um, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of bias that really work against you. Um, one of the laws that we did get passed here in Seattle is that they can't discriminate on the basis of what kind of payment you have, so what your source of income is. And that was a really big deal because they were just out of hand, just getting rid of anybody that was on Medicare, Medicaid, whatever. Um, they're like, nah, we don't want those people. Um, and now th that's not legal in Seattle. It's not ethical. Um, and I'm sure people still try to do it. But, um, but that was one thing, was to try to get that, um, that law through so that people couldn't be discriminated against on the basis of what their f source of payment is. The other one that we need to push harder is around um, felony convictions because so many people uh, who've, who are homeless are in and out of jail, not necessarily fel felonies, but um, it's, there's this cycling because you're on the street, you get into trouble, people come and beat you up, you may end up being the person who gets arrested just because you were fighting back. Um, and there's this cycling that happens and a lot of people who go to prison come out and are homeless because there isn't a good transition for them. Um, and that's another population that's disproportionately represented among the homeless. And uh, all the stereotypes that go with incarceration. Um, um, 
I think I want to pick up on something Tyrone said because I think the judgments that other people make of people who are homeless are a big part, a big barrier. And I, one thing I would like to plead of all of you is I think we have to do a better job of telling the story. I've been struck so many times during this last couple of months as people have been talking about the homelessness crisis in Seattle. And the th phrases get thrown around like, oh, we've been throwing money at this problem for years and there doesn't seem to be any result. Wait a second, we haven't been throwing money at it for years. We have underfunded all the services. You've been hearing about some of them up here, but, um, and I'd love it if, if we could find a better way to tell the story about the stereotypes the assumptions that people make about people who are homeless and why they're homeless and the judgments that are made about them. We're, we obviously have not done a good job in counteracting that and I think that's on all of us to try to do something about. Nancy, I think that was a really good segue to the next question. Why does homelessness generate so much confusion and debate? Um, I think a lot of it is because people view, like pe people who are housed, who are a little bit more stable uh, housing wise, they view people who are either like couch surfing, who are living in shelters, or experiencing homelessness, however they're experiencing it, as, as an other. Like they don't view someone who is currently living in their car as I could become that person. And, and let me tell you, after going through, I think we're at like 1,200 court records right now, uh, all of us could be that person, right? Except maybe Jeff Bezos. But like, otherwise we could very easily be sleeping in our car. We could be very easily sleeping on the street. It's, it's not that far off. Um, and I think that because people are like, oh, this person's an other. They must have done something to deserve this, right? Uh, there's like a lot of blame on the individual. No one wants to like look back at themselves and be like, I have like create, I've contributed to creating a system that is pushing people into homelessness, right? And and just a quick example. So, um, I, how many people have heard about the head tax? Okay. Really quick, the head tax was passed a couple weeks ago. It would tax the top 3% of businesses. It would raise roughly $47 million a year. About 70% of that money is supposed to go towards building housing, 30% of it towards services. Guess who's spending a lot of money to try to put it on the ballot to repeal? Big business. They dropped like $350,000 just to collect signatures. So I'm sure all of you have probably run into a canvasser right now. So as someone who's done a lot of petition gathering for a variety of initiatives, I have zero, I'm comfortable talking to people. So I stood next to some, some of those canvassers to try and educate people who they were trying to talk to. Let me tell you, when a signature, is a, when a signature gatherer gets paid per signature, they really don't like it when you do that, right? <laughs> um, and I think an example of, of this confusion and debate is there was one man who came, and I always just talk to people, I'm like, hey, this is what the head tax would do. By the way, Jeff Bezos makes about $52 million a year. So he himself, he himself, not Amazon, he himself makes more than that tax would raise in the entire year. So, you know, keep just a, just a heads up. <laughs> and our tax system is so strict that we can't have an income tax. So you could raise the property tax, you could raise the uh, be no tax on all businesses. You could raise the sales tax, which would disproportionately hurt poor people. Or you can maybe just tax the top 3% of businesses. Right? And it's a tax that's, I mean, I know I'll, I'll get to the specific of the story, but I'm telling folks that sort of information. And a lot of these paid signature gatherers are not even from Washington. They're shipped in here and they're saying all sorts of nonsense, right? One guy comes up and he's like, I know what I'm signing. I need to sign this. And I'm like, okay, dude, you, you're right, I guess. And he starts yelling about how homeless people should just go get jobs. Right? It's like, why aren't they getting jobs? And I was like, do you know the average rent in Seattle is $2,300? Right? Like, even if you have that job, how are you paying that rent? Right? Um, and then he's going on and on about how he worked 
keep in mind, this is a man who is much, much older than me, so I'm assuming he lived in Seattle when it was not this expensive, when he, he was not my, he's not a 28 year old trying to make it when rent is $2,300, right? And another man comes up, and I just you know have the same rap as I'm talking, and he starts tearing up, and I was a little thrown off by that because I'm used to people being angry with me, not like getting a little emotional. And he was like, you know, I've been homeless for two years, and I was like, wow. And there's this guy yelling about how homeless people should get jobs, and he's like, you know, I've been trying to get into housing, I can't. He's like, I just can't do it, and he starts crying, getting really emotional. Because he's witnessing all of these people say this is just vitriol about how we need to, somehow it's bad to try to tax big business. And how dare they try to get money for people who are homeless. Like, you have this happening right here. Because this is in front of the Seattle library downtown, right? So you have like this, you have high powered businessy types as well as people who are experiencing homelessness, like all in this area. So it's just like, I think a lot of it is because, again, that's an example to me of how, and I told this, that older gentleman, I was like, look, I hope that you don't have one bad thing that happens to you. I hope you don't get hurt. I hope that your partner doesn't die. I hope you don't lose your job. Because all of those things, as I'm going through these hundreds of court records, that one of those three things pushes people into homelessness, right? Or people just can't afford the rent. You lose your job, you lose a couple hours at work. It's, and, it, and we have this culture that just puts blame on the individual instead of thinking like, how can we change the system? So, sorry, that was a little long-winded, but. Okay, that's gonna bring us to our last question, which I know all of you guys have touched on a lot tonight. But what can the common person do to help home, the homeless crisis on an individual level, community level, policy level? What would your suggestions be? I'll go. Nobody will be surprised. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Register and vote. Yes, and help people who are not registered. By the way, we have a pretty good track record in our state. 80% of the eligibles are registered. We have a very poor track record when it comes to turnout. In many of our counties, fewer than half of the registered voters actually vote. And among the people or the groups that have a low registration and a low turnout are homeless people, people who have had a felony on their records and don't know that you can vote in Washington if you have a felony on your record in the past. If you're no longer under court supervision, you can vote. We changed the law here. And among the people who are also low registration are people from communities of color and for whom English is not a first language. So think about who you could help register and talk to about how important our votes are when it comes to the simple matter of we need to have affordable housing, we need to have a fair tax system, and we need to be non-judgmental or certainly at least less judgmental about people who are going through bad times and having a hard time paying the huge rents that you've been hearing about. Uh, but it means we all have to speak up, it means we have to talk to other people, and it means we have to talk to our elected officials. Well, I, I was going to say something a little bit. This is going to sound a little bit corny, but I think just from each individual, I think what we should do is really get to know, besides voting, of course, and everything else, is to really get to know um, each individual that you see that walks by our homeless. You know, because one of the biggest issues that I have besides me, you know, being big and tall, you know, people are, are very intimidated by my size. And one of the issues was um, that I couldn't really go into bathrooms or anything because I was carrying a book bag. You know, even though I dress properly, I never heard a box or anything like that. I always wash, I never smell, you know, but it seems like I was um, a second class citizen. You know, I was, they looked, they looked down at me. You know, I don't want nobody to look down at me because I'm going through, you know, just you know, a little something, you know, really nothing. You know, but at the end of the day, I think we need to 
learn how to respect people that are going through something because it could be one of you that could lose everything that you have and you can be put your, your stuff can be out here sleeping outside too you know so don't think within a second that you can be in their shoes so all I'm saying is that you know give them the same respect that you will give yourself because you may never know that person might be your boss in the future <laughs> you know and that's just how that's just how I see it you know? So I think that there are so many ways um, to to work on homelessness. Um, for for many years, I have just focused on direct service, medical service, medical outreach, um, really making people feel safe to ask for whatever it is that they need, whether it's birth control or depression or whatever the problem is. Um, just to make it easier for people um, in whatever language they need. Um, but there are, I now also teach a course on homelessness that's in the winter quarter. Um, and it's a really great way of engaging with students from all parts of the university. And, um, and, we, and they do projects as part of their coursework. Uh, working with different homeless organizations um, and it's a great way to engage students um, as I said I, I work with students in the U District Street Medicine and also at um, DESC um, and one of the speakers at our class was uh, Sharon Lee who's the head of Lehigh the Low Income Housing Institute and she talked a lot about the tiny house stuff and I have recently gotten to know some of the tiny house people in my neighborhood um, and the goal for Lehigh is to have a tiny house village in every neighborhood in Seattle so that it would be easy to just go down the street and say you know how can I help um, or just get to know people and um, so uh, some of my workmates at the MedEx PA training program and I built a tiny house this spring. It took us three weekends and not all day every weekend but you know it costs around two thousand four hundred dollars for the materials and um, and it was a great project and um, I really I mean, I've been working a lot with tent cities, but tiny houses have a lot of good things that tents don't have. Number one, you can lock the door, right? You have privacy. You can actually stand up, you know, in a tent. Imagine if you're a tall person trying to put your pants on and you can't even stand up in the tent. You know, it's quite inconvenient, especially a lot of the people who are in the camps are very disabled um, and you know are on crutches and stuff I mean it's like amazing what a difference it would be to be able to stand up to get dressed <laughs> and have room to put your things and and to have a regular bathroom and a regular shower and a kitchen you could use um, there there is such a wide range of organizations like Roots and other shelters that all take volunteers. Um, and there are so many programs um, that are understaffed <laughs> and underfunded. Um, so I think that there's like so many things that people can do that you could find something really that you really wanted to do, that you were really interested in, that really worked for you to give and, and make it be a, a genuine, positive experience both ways. Um, well, I think what I'm going to say is probably going to get into the next question. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so for me, I think that um, we need to be doing direct service where it can and things like that but I want to get to the point where we don't even need to do direct service and so um, I'm definitely of the belief that we need 
political change. And I'm not talking about like party. I'm talking about like passing different laws, changing our tax system. And I think sometimes people think that is something that you know, professors do, lawyers do, all that sort of stuff, which is not true. My organization, like I said, is made up of people who are experiencing these issues. And when you come together, like I always use this example for organizing. It's like, if I have my hand, my fingers separated like this, I can't really do much, but I put, put them together in a fist. I, well, if I was stronger, I could do a lot of damage, right? Um, but, uh, the, if coming together, we can fight all of these, um, th we can fight the way the system is and we can change it. And just an example is that uh, I have a member who I've, I recent, who's recently been a part of my organization. Um, she had been evicted from Seattle Housing Authority. And as she was going through that process, she as an individual was just reaching out to every single politician you could think of. Right, and a couple of them would respond very nicely, but they weren't really taking her seriously. But then she gets involved with the other group of people, right? So she gets involved in my organization, and then we're able to bring in a couple unions, a couple other folks, right? And all of a sudden, her story is in the stranger, right? Talking about SHA's eviction practices. Then we went to the, and this recently happened. We went to the uh, board meeting of SHA. And we delivered a letter. And she got to be the person to deliver this letter on behalf of 24 organizations, right? Saying, you got to change. And I'm getting, now getting calls from board members being like, hey, you know, I, I don't, let's talk, right? Her by herself couldn't have gotten to that point, right? Me by myself couldn't get to that point. It's about coming together and putting pressure. Because like, I don't really believe in asking for things nicely because I don't think that really gets people very far um, when you're talking to people with power. I think that politicians exist to be put in corners and forced to do what we want, right? But the only way that we can do that is by organizing, showing up, meeting with them, sharing your story, um, going to council meetings, and just pushing them really hard. And especially for people who are personally impacted, who have been evicted, who are currently homeless, who are renters, like lifting up your stories are the, I think is the most important thing that we should be doing. So if you wanna get involved in political change, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jordan, our volunteer service coordinator at Roots, to say a little something. You can talk into this. Is the mic? Yeah. I like the microphone. <laughs> Thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, can we get a round of applause for our panelists? <laughs> So my name is Jordan. I'm the volunteer services manager at Roots Young Adult Shelter. For those of you who aren't familiar, Roots is the state's largest shelter for young adults who are experiencing homelessness. Every night we serve 45 young adults between the ages of 18 to 25 by providing a safe place to sleep, warm meals, and other essential services. We have case management services. We have a jobs training program. We are really big on making a difference in the lives of the young people that we serve. And something that really sets Roots apart is that a lot of shelters have pretty minimal staff, lots of people who stay there, not very much engagement with the folks who are staying there, you know, maybe a couple of staff people roaming the floor to make sure everybody's safe, but not, you know, a lot, not a lot of individual engagement. Something that really sets Roots apart is that on any given night, our goal is for every three guests that we serve to have one volunteer or staff member present. This allows us to provide our guests with a lot of individual support. What our volunteers do primarily is just hang out with our guests, chat about each other's days, watch TV shows together, play a board game, share some food. Just that community building aspect is huge. And it makes a really big difference in the lives of young people that we serve. We find that individual engagement and support for example, directly translates into positive housing outcomes. So if you're interested in helping address homelessness in the community, one thing that you can do that would make a huge difference is to volunteer with us at Roots. I wanna turn your attention to these cards that are at the end of your table. 
that say get involved today. There's a stack of pins with them. These highlight some of the ways that you can get involved in Roots' work. I would encourage you to consider signing up for our new volunteer orientation. We have two orientations coming up in June. That's a great way to learn more about our volunteer program and the ways that you can make a difference in the lives of young adults who are experiencing homelessness. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, and thank you, panelists, again. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. If you guys have questions, we can pass around this fun microphone. OK, you ready? Um, uh, hi, good evening. Um, I'm David Chung. I come from China and Singapore. Uh, so I, I was really involved in a charity uh, volunteer work uh, in bo uh, both countries. Uh, so my question is, uh, between the two courses, co uh, co uh, courses um, problems, uh, reasons that being um, uh, greedy and uh, a lack of compassion and uh, uh, fundamental pro structural problems in politics and economic policies, uh, which one is bigger and why? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm kind of trained in economics and politics. Oh, and no. <laughs> I mean, this is all personal opinion, right? So, okay, I, who knows if I have any business saying any of the things I'm saying, but anyway. Um, I mean, I think if greed goes unchecked, we get this, right? I think there's just, I think there's a lot of fundamental aspects about humanity, right? And one of those is being selfish and greedy. Right, I think that's just, that's just that, that's one of the parts of being human, right? Uh, you want to make sure that you're taken care of, you want to make sure your family's taken care of, and things like that. So it doesn't necessarily, um, it's not necessarily rooted in a bad thing, but if it goes unchecked, you end up getting rents that are like three grand, right? That aren't necessarily tied to anything other than I know I can find someone to pay that, right? And I think that our government is supposed to exist to control those unchecked negative aspects of humanity and when it doesn't and i and i'm from north carolina right and uh uh there's the thing that's very shocking to me is that washington has this um reputation for being very progressive right but we have this streak in, in, in our culture out here, I would say even more so it's worse than in North Carolina, is this idea that uh, my property is my property is my property and the government cannot tell me what to do about that, right? And then that kind of, it, it, I've heard whenever I hear landlords talking about how dare you tell me that I have to accept Section 8, this is my property. How dare you tell me that um, I have to, um, <laughs> There's not very many tenant rights. I'm trying to think of another example, but generally, when we were pushing for the move in fee reform legislation, like they wanted to be able to charge six grand up front, it was their right. And it's like, if we don't check those just human aspects of ourselves, we get this situation. So I think greed is the root, and the structure is a result of that. For the last 10 years, or 12 years, um, the city has just allowed unrestricted growth um, and pretty much sold out to the developers. Um, and, you know, it's, there's been a couple, four administrations in the mayor's area um, where that was true. It started with Nichols, Shell, who were Shell was a developer, um, and it kept on going. Um, and the whole question of changing the nature of the city, the um, what's good for the community, the livability of of the city, all those kinds of things were just completely not addressed by the city government. Um, and they just like develop, develop, develop. And um, so there's a lot of things about our political system um, and part of it is really not having enough people looking at what is really going on and being willing to, 
go to those meetings, the council meetings and, and other meetings that the mayor holds, um, to, to voice these kinds of concerns. Um, so I have a friend here who lives, they bought their house here in the U District like 25 years ago and, um, and they are constantly going to these meetings where they're saying, yes, we should just tear down everything and develop these big things and get rid of all these single family houses. Um, and, you know, he's saying they don't realize that the things they're going to build are actually not going to be affordable to A, students, B, people who work at the 7-Eleven, anyone who doesn't have, like, huge amounts of backing, you know. So, like, um, when I, my partner and I, we bought our house in 1981. So that was before the market rose. And in those days, money was expensive. It's like 12 to 14 percent interest. And houses were cheap. And then it switched and houses got more expensive and money got cheap. And there's some sort of big things about our economy, the whole boom and bust thing, and how many times the people who are most harmed by the busts don't benefit from the booms. And, and that's what we're seeing now is that, you know, people lost a lot, a lot of people lost homes. In, and I just want to say about greed, those <coughs> mortgage brokers, targeted people who they knew were not going to be able to stay in those homes. They got them to invest all of their savings, whether that was like $8,000 or whatever, to get people into these houses that they weren't going to be able to keep. And they targeted people, specifically people of color, young um, single parents, people that really would love to own a home and thought that it was, you know, it's the American dream, but, but it was, they were gypped. They were purposely targeted and lost all their savings and lost their homes. And I mean, it was just, again, unconscionable that this is exactly what happened. And what happened out of the bust, many of those people are still very, very poor and the rich got richer and it has been um, this boom and bust economy the basis of capitalism is one of the reasons why poverty remains an un uh, we have not put a dent in it for quite a few years thank you does anyone have any other questions yeah. Oh yeah, there we go. Hi, my name is Sue Nichols. I work with a number of groups in Snohomish County. And in Snohomish County, I just heard from HASCO, which is the Housing Authority of Snohomish County, that we actually have an eight-year public housing list. So even two years longer than, I don't know if it's Seattle or King County or both. So it's tough. Um, one thing I do see in working with a lot of groups is a, kind of an institutional problem. We, most of us want to keep track of sex offenders, and yet there's nowhere for them to go. No one will rent to them. People won't hire them. So we've created this sort of institutional class of people who many of whom in Snohomish County are living under the bridge or um, out in the woods. And to turn and look at those people and say, well, they need to get a job, it's like we've, we've kind of created this class of people, but we don't want to do anything about it. So I just wanted to hear your comments on that thought. Um, well, I get, it's interesting. That's like a issue that I've talked a lot about, like internally with the so we work a lot with the lawyer, which by the way, you guys should Google Housing Justice Project if you're ever facing eviction in King County. There's usually, I think there's one in Snohomish too, Housing Justice Project, free attorneys, just so you know. Anyway, and I think 
that's a, a struggle that we're going to have to answer for ourselves as a, as, as a society, right? Because I'll be at, like, in working in mass incarceration, we have members who have committed serious crimes. Like, I have a member who committed murder, right? So, like, very serious crimes. Because one of the things that we're also working on is parole. But interestingly, even within that group of folks who they've, you know, commit, uh, they've either have family members who've been convicted of serious crimes or they themselves have committed serious crimes, um, sex offenders, it's like this taboo thing. And I'll be honest, I have a huge, I have like a personal experience that makes it very hard for me to like uh, not view people who I know are sex offenders in a very specific way. But like the intellectual side of me is like thinking in the same lines of they're people. People need to live somewhere, right? And I think that that's a struggle that people are not comfortable having. And I don't even think we're okay even talking about it, right? And if we can't even talk about it, how the hell are we gonna even build a build somewhere, right? And so I think that um, we need to Right, because it's not, I can't imagine for anyone coming out of prison that being homeless without a job is gonna somehow make you not, make you better off, right? Um, and I, I don't know what the, I mean, I think generally the answer to these things is, is more money, because if there was a lot of more money to build housing, then there wouldn't be this sort of, we're gonna choose this better poor person instead of this poor person because I think the system we have is is putting value on who's a better poor person and I've heard I've heard a, the attorneys who work for housing authorities the way they talk about tenants who fall behind on rent it's like they failed as as the poor person we're serving we want to serve a different poor person right and it just has this mindset of blame who deserves housing and, and, and all these other things, I think that we as a society just need to get to the place to where everyone, regardless of who you are, should have a safe place to sleep. But we got a long way to go on that. Um, the way that most of the tent cities and small villages are organized, um, they're internally democratic and they have really strict rules. And one of those rules is no sex offenders can live in the tent cities or the small villages. I mean, it's like, it doesn't, you're not just homeless, you're like not allowed to live in the homeless camp. It, it, and one of the things is, you know, a lot of people who become homeless were abused as children. A lot of people who are go to jail, have histories of abuse. A lot of people who are sex offenders have histories of abuse. It just starts so much earlier. People who are homeless as children are much more likely to be homeless as adults. Um, and the way that our criminal justice system works continues to just propel that into the future. Okay, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you all for coming. Change starts with us, and it starts with conversations like these. Uh, another round of applause for our panelists. Can we also get a round of applause for Daniela, who worked so hard for us?